Nothing in this podcast is intended as investment advice and the people in this podcast may hold positions in the stocks they talk about. Do not buy any investment based solely on a tip or recommendation. Please do your own research. Hello and welcome to the Sunday Roast. It's Sunday the 22nd of May and we're well and truly blessed with this weather. I mean, it feels like, really does feel like summer's here. I've been out for a meal with a wife today. It's a birthday and uh, probably had way too many uh, bottles of wine or even glasses. Some would measure it in glasses. I tend to measure it in bottles these days. So um, <laughs> I'm not really, I'm not even going to ask what the weather's like in Egypt this week because I know if we're having good weather here, then it's going to be at least add another 10 degrees on at least. Um, that's probably your weather in Cairo so frankly I really couldn't care what it's doing out there (laughs) now today we're joined by Callum Summerton CEO of Chill Brands Um, I know Callum looking at your backdrop there you're you're obviously you know you're in America you're at you're at the Chill Brands headquarters take us through your 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 journey and, and how things have been since you you made CEO of Chill Brands yeah hi uh Phil and Kevin it's good to be with you today again uh, I am out in Colorado at the moment. I joined the team out here on Monday, uh, so we're seven hours behind the UK. It's lovely and warm. Uh, I'm really kind of getting to grips with how our business is running in the US. Yeah, as you say, a lot has happened in the last month. We closed out our raise. We've announced an open offer. And that's all stuff that the market knows about. But really, I guess what I'm learning now in the States, and I, I knew a lot of this already, but it's really good to see it on the ground, is what's happening in the retail environment here what the kind of micros and macros are that we need to pay attention to for chill in digital in retail and whatever else. And so I'm spending my time at the moment just meeting as many of our partners, getting out to convenience stores and gas stations and just seeing what's going on in the environment and, and how we can maximize our impact and how we can in the next few months really start to get some traction again. How's it going when you go into these convenience stores? Then I suppose that's the simple question that the investor will want to know you know the good the bad and the ugly tell tell us a bit about your experiences when you've been at these gas stores yeah so it's really interesting you know in the uk when we go into a gas station or a petrol station as we call it uh they all pretty much look the same you know it's exactly the same in every bp or, or whatever else you go to here there is real differentiation between the convenience stores that we're going into some are very very sophisticated their top line uh, and they uh, have a, uniform, uh, a uniformity that we can rely on. So we, we go to these places, they're professionals, and they're already you know, dealing with marketing collateral, working out how to sell the products, um, and, and providing a kind of engaging uh, experience for the consumer. Others are far less sophisticated there, as they say here, mom and pop outfits um, that we need to nurture a little bit more, and we're getting better at that. But I think the biggest take-home for me in visiting these locations, in talking to the people, not my team, but just you know people on the street, is how hard the pandemic actually hit the US in the convenience store environment. We thought that in the UK, you know, in the US, they're largely ignoring all of the restrictions, etc. Wasn't quite the case, and so convenience stores were massively affected. Distributors were massively and badly affected. Truckers were very badly affected. You know, they could barely in the way that we had the same struggles, they could barely get their products around. And that was the same here. And again, you had people who certainly were leaving their homes during their kind of mandatory exercise of the day to get bread and milk, not to make surreptitious purchases of CBD. And that's not to say that Chill didn't make mistakes along the way there, but it's interesting to see how now that environment is starting to recover, but was affected in a massive way. So what we're really seeing in those stores is they've really struggled. They're now coming out the other side of that. All of our partners have found themselves in that same kind of microcosm during the pandemic. And it's how in a post-pandemic world, you can create a quality retail channel in those stores as they start to pick up traffic again. We're doing that with our display cases through getting out there into the world, sending you know, relatively senior members of the team out into the stores to chat to them and to provide them with the face time they need to understand the products, sell as much as they can. It really comes down to relationships. That is the number one thing in these stores, because particularly in the, the independent mom and pop shops, which are very successful when you set them up right, they need some nurturing. And that's what we're giving them now. You are going to some pretty successful. Have you been to any of the smoker friendly shops, for instance? That's one of the ones yeah. that I, I think have done quite well. 
I have been into the smoker friendly shops. Uh, they are um, they're amazing in the sense that uh, again, you know, a lot of our UK investors not, might not be familiar with uh, places of this kind of nature. So it's like a tobacconist's, uh, but on a whole new level. A lot of the people who are going into those stores, they're going in there bluntly to buy as much tobacco as they possibly can for the lowest price. And what we're finding is that the way that we pitch our product, not necessarily as just this kind of CBD new thing, but as a genuine alternative that provides them with all of the kind of oral fixation of a pouch or a smoke, all of the kind of flavor that they're used to, particularly with the menthols, they can't, they're not as readily available, certainly not in the UK, but also in the US as they used to be. We can provide that to them um, and we are successful in a lot of those stores where we've had these kind of close touching points. The other ones that I've been into, which I think we can delineate our retail channel a little bit into various strands. We've got convenience stores and gas stations like your 7-Elevens, uh, your Circle Ks, your uh, Yes Way Allsups. You've got specialist CBD and smoke shops where our products really are standing out because they're not trying to fit within the, the kind of cannabis world. They're trying to be a, another product entirely and they do stand out there. And then you've also got these smoker friendlies. And, uh, you know, the truth of the matter is that we're successful in some of all of those shops and not in others. Uh, and it's just trying to find out exactly which of those are working, why they're working and scaling that out and not just trying to, to hit it with a blunt instrument, if that makes sense. So, I mean, obviously there was a lot of talk in the past about 10,000 stores by X, Y, Z, date yep. and 10,000 stores by another date and da, da 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 basically you've come in brushed this clean trying to put this in 10,000 stores even with the money you have now is basically a physical impossibility I take it absolutely I mean the, the main thing to consider there is that there is so much investment needed to get into a store but then that is not a one-off a one-off spend. You have to continue feeding it and nurturing it and, and continuing to put in marketing collateral and time and effort to make sure the stores keep selling. So it's not an open it up one and done job. It's an ongoing process. Starts off with somewhere in the region of $1,000. That varies from, from whatever kind of store class or category you're looking at. And so to do 10,000, we would need you know, upwards of $10 million, 10 million pounds, if not more beyond that and that's before you even start trying to fund the business you know there are costs associated with running a plc trying to grow your online footprint and doing the kind of r d projects that we're now getting into and so you're right yeah it is a physical impossibility to launch that many stores uh, i think that's something that as i said before when we were announcing those targets in the past the business simply wasn't ready they didn't have an appreciation of exactly what it was going to cost in man hours or in dollars but also the main thing to bear in mind is that store count or just store number is totally arbitrary. The main thing that matters is sell through. And again, you know, the numbers don't quite stack up right on this, but I would rather be selling significantly more products in a handful of stores than next to nothing in thousands. Yeah. And I mean, uh, obviously to build the brand and to build, build chill.com, which I mean, many of the investors have got blue sky views of the chill.com and the fact that, or not chill.com, but chill as a brand, that it can be, you know, huge. I mean, it can be a Red Bull type thing that people will come to chill for whatever uh, to relax. So how do you see or how long do you see it will take to build a base to be able to then start building that out to something that is this blue sky vision? Yeah, I, I, we're already on the road for that. So I started in the business update with last uh, last week, but we're going to continue putting out metrics specifically for the online because the number one metric for us, our digital, is traffic and eyeballs on the site. It's all about brand awareness. It's all about people getting to see our content, our products. Every single metric in our online is trending upwards in a very, very significant way. That's not to say that we're generating tons of revenue off it quite yet. But everything is moving in the right direction. And we've barely scratched the surface. You know, we're allocating you know, maximum $2,000 a month to that at the moment. You start to scale that outwards in any way whatsoever. And, you know, the, the bet is really there that we're going to gain some serious traction. We start to get a significant number of eyeballs on the site. And provided you continue to make sure your user experience is right, your conversions are working, 
that does translate into revenue. You know, we're, we're seeing a significant number of repeat purchases or return customers on chill.com. That's very, very useful for us as well. Um, the real power of that chill brand, the way that I see it, is that it, it takes to the mainstream these kind of cannabis, cannabinoid, functional products. And I want to get into this, uh, this concept as well of not just being a CBD or cannabis company, but being more widely functional, natural products. And we are looking at other compounds at the moment that can allow us to uh, diversify and differentiate. Um, but really, it comes down to that chill, chill word. Uh, if you look at, there's a brand in the UK that some of our, our shareholders, investors, and your listeners might be familiar with, which is called um, Calms. I think it's spelled with a K. And those are the natural kind of herbal tablets that people buy. I think they've got St. John's wort in them and they're uh, mood uplifting. The brand is called Calms and they don't have to make a single health claim or get even close to a regulator being frustrated with what they're doing because their name does what it says on the tin. The same is true of Chill. That is the project. It's trying to give people the kind of calm, tranquility, clarity that they're looking for through these products without uh, putting the brand, the company, its staff, its investors in the line of fire for making a lot of the claims that some of our competitors do. Moving on slightly, you're sitting behind a big sign which says chill.com and the glasses and a smiley face. How much do we really think this chill.com is worth? Because we, we haven't, as a company, I'm, I'm using the Royal Week as I'm sure, but the, the company itself has not used this to its best ability as yet. But is there an opportunity that chill.com can get other traffic coming through it that's not chill.com that, that we can get revenue for? I mean, I don't know. I'm just looking at it as a as a big opportunity in terms of websites. So tell, tell, tell us a little bit more what you think. Yes, yeah, so, so just on the valuation of chill.com itself as an intangible asset, it's something that I announced I wanted as soon as it was paid off to get sort of appraised. I, I really, I wouldn't like to give a, a time scale for how long that's going to take because it's difficult to value an intangible like that. I spoke with our domain broker yesterday to get final balances and to, to get settled up. Uh, and what she told me was really quite encouraging on that is that we're seeing domains at the moment where people are placing offers for them in the mid seven figures, you know, and they're not being taken. People aren't taking them. The domain market is blowing up. Uh, it's really worth kind of just visiting at the moment domain sale forums or kind of domain sale uh, news articles and seeing what's going at the moment because there are really very impressive numbers being abounded around. Um, and you know, while elsewhere we're in this bear market, that is certainly a bull market right now. Again, I don't know exactly what that means for chill.com, but just real finger in the air stuff, I think we'd be looking at significantly more than we paid for it. So that's the first element there. But in terms of actually capitalizing on it, because you know, I'm not, I'm not interested in selling it at this stage, we want to, to make the most of it and you know, turn it into a revenue generator. We are absolutely trying to attract other traffic. So yeah, chill products, the more of those we sell, great. But it's wider than that. It's about eyeballs. As I said, traffic is our main metric there. And so I mentioned in that RNS recently, we're looking at establishing this marketplace, not in the same way as an eBay or an Amazon, but a highly selective, curated, natural product, natural compound marketplace. What we're trying to offer people there is authoritative, trusted products. You know, a lot of people are still scared of CBD. You know, I speak to people and they think, is it going to get me high? Am I going to pass a drugs test? Well, yes, you are provided you're buying the right products and you're educated on it. And that's what we're trying to do uh, with chill.com. The best example you can look to there is a company called Leafly in the USA. So Leafly is the number one uh, cannabis aggregator of, of THC, of the psychoactive stuff. And they don't sell any cannabis. It's all media. It's all education. They're making their money through affiliate links. But if you look at what they're doing and you look at the opportunity in, in this space with CBD, but more widely, you know, some of the mushroom compounds, some of the others, there is a real prize for the taking in educating people, in creating media and in encouraging people to understand and engage with the plants. And that's how we get traffic to chill.com. And, and from that, that can be monetized in a multitude of ways, obviously. Other products as well as the chill ones, obviously. Precisely that. And that is uh, something that we're looking at very, very closely right now is where Antonio is at the moment. Uh, and he is out in the market kind of discussing with these partners who would be looking to onboard. As I said, we're going to be very, very selective with that process. Um, but we want to be getting best in class partners 
that are not necessarily competitors. They're selling analogous, complementary products to us. And it gives people this opportunity when they're on chill.com, sure, to buy a chill gummy or eventually a Zoetic tincture if it's onboarded onto there. Yeah. But also, you know, a very novel, high quality uh, CBD beverage, a novel, high quality vapor product, even, or something of that description. And it's, it's all about differentiation and diversification that's going to allow us to win long term. So let's talk a bit, little bit about you, Callum, right? You know, you, you're a young guy, you've come into this role. And you've alluded to the fact in the past that, you, you know, during lockdown, you had a, had a business that, that, you know, that basically kind of, like, say, redefined or created a new mechanism for house, house sales. You know, you had this amazing software and the way that you could do effectively tours of houses, during, you know, for effectively real estate and estate agents. And, you know, your business did really well out of that. How does your um you know entrepreneurial mind come into this into this role and how confident are you that you can turn this company around like almost an ailing company right that you know so effectively what i'm trying to ask is why would a new investor want to invest in you and the company now that you're at the helm like like what give us a reason why you think you can turn this around and make this a really successful company going forward I think uh, part of it comes down to looking at it in very kind of micro terms, legally and financially. You think about the, the kind of guys before me, Trevor Antonio, and the way the company was run. And also a lot of the reason investors are invested in Chill or have been historically is because they've got this big dream. They see Chill.com or they see the brand Chill and they think it's blue ocean in CBD. We're going to grow and grow and grow. All of that is is really compelling it's really interesting but you've got to drill down and and do a bit of reductionism there to think all right so so how do you get to that it's no good just pursuing the dream and the goal unless you have the mechanism for getting there and what i'm trying to do here is is insert the due process without diluting the dream it's giving us these staged milestones to get there and you know in, in cbd um i guess what i'm seeing and what i'm trying to do with with my lens is take a market that has been very, very saturated, oversaturated uh, with companies who are, are coming in. You know, we call them Me Too brands because they come in, they look exactly the same, and they do exactly the same thing. And most of them, by the way, are white labeled from the same place. So what we're trying to do with Chill now, what what my main focus is here, is really setting us apart. And the way that you start doing that is articulating exactly why you buy the products, exactly what they are, and uh, trying to create uh, a lifestyle around the product rather than just selling it, selling it into somebody's life for the sake of it. That's what I think the opportunity here is at Chill. The investment case here is that it is one of the world's, I would suggest, only truly di- uh, differentiated CBD companies because there are very few people out, out there at the moment doing what we're doing with the pouches, with the smokes. There's a lot doing tinctures and gummies. Um, But even those, I would suggest that we're differentiated on. Our gummies are a candy first and a CBD delivery mechanism second. And it's when you take CBD as a compound outside of this world of just buy it because it's a, a new thing and you should try it and it's supposed to be a wonder chemical. When you insert it into lives and routines and people who want to chill, that's when you start to make a connection. That's when you get recurring customers. That's when you get traction. Most of the opportunities that we've had in the last almost a year have come from people seeing that brand name and seeing the website particularly and thinking, wow, these guys really are different. And as a result of that, I've had phone calls with companies that are far larger than us in the tobacco space and in other spaces who, you know, we, we had no real right speaking to, but they're interested because of that behind me, because of the brand. Yeah, and I, I feel at this value now, and yeah, you don't have to answer this because ultimately you cannot answer it, but I feel at this value, you know, with the cash on board, we're basically valuing chill.com at six or seven million pounds as a, as a, as a uh, portal, if you like, and the rest of the company is, is at zero, you know, and ultimately you've got potential for uh, for the feminized seeds as well which we haven't really spoken about maybe you can give us a bit more background on that and we've got many many outs of products what what i see chill have done is they've really differentiated themselves 
in different sporting fields as well. You've got the football, you've got the rodeo, which coming from a UK centric background, we're going rodeo. What's that all about? Can't be many people that do that. But actually, I think it's fairly big deal in the US. You got baseball players, I think, who do the pouches and maybe uh, they're doing tobacco pouches. So there's all sorts of cancer and stuff like that. Yeah, Phil's showing up one of the things there with the rodeo uh, man on the box there. Um, so g- give us a bit of a overview of, the, of those other things, you know. I mean, because I basically see this now. Obviously, there's a lot of inherent risks in, in any of these companies. So I'm not going to turn around and say it's a complete free hit. But I look at it now and say, you know, this stock was over a pound a year ago or just over a year ago. It's now sitting at 2.85 pence and it's going to double the shares in issue so that it so that it has four million pounds plus, I think, in cash or four million pounds in cash, some of which will be used to to pay for the rest of chill.com. Granted, where's it going? Like in terms of all of these different areas, the seeds and the different uh, football, rodeo, baseball, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the real the real way to approach our spending now is to get super data driven with it. We've got an asset like chill.com because it allows us to harvest industry data on CBD and, and widely just the, the cannabis and functional products or functional natural products market. So every single dollar that we want to be spending or will be spending is going to come back down to some return metric. Uh, I think it was difficult for CBD companies to do that in the past because it's a brand new market and there just wasn't the kind of understanding of, how to spend, where to spend, and, and how to inform yourself about what your best return on investment strategy might have been. Um, you know, you're right on the sporting comment as well. We have uh, set ourselves apart a little bit by the partnerships that we've created. If you look at the Major Arena Soccer League, um, you know, a, a couple of things to discuss on that. Ronaldinho has just bought an extension team there, which uh, I didn't know about that deal, and nobody else could until uh, it was struck. But I mean, wow. That, that shows that there is something up and coming. The, the way that we've always approached it, these deals is uh, rather than just sponsoring the big guys, spending a lot of money to get a big celebrity name into it, we'd rather grow at the grassroots level. So with the rodeo guys, we found, uh, you know, in Creek Young, a guy who was pretty fresh to rodeo, which is a big sport, Western Heritage in the USA, and, uh, and basically just said, we want to grow with you. We want to support you. And he turned out to be rookie of the year in his first major season. And so the fact that Chill was attached to him uh, was really, you know, phenomenal luck, but also a real testament, I think, to the strategy of finding these people and ingratiating yourself into a sporting community or a marketing setting uh, without doing it just going straight to the top. You really get that authentic uh, relationship with them at that point. I think outside of that, you know, what is our strategy going forward when you've got Mazel, you've got Rodeo, um, you know, various other properties, is really to drill down more and try to find the demographics that are using these products and appeal to them. So, you know, anyone who's followed uh, CBD for a while or knows companies in the space know that there is a real uh, challenge in marketing online spending um, in PPC or pay-per-click ads for Google, for Instagram, for Facebook. If we try to do that on, let's say, even the Zoetic products, which aren't um, tobacco alternatives, the likelihood is our Instagram accounts would get banned. But what we can do is engage with influencers uh, and people at the kind of right level who are touching and speaking with our demographics every day and get them to to talk about uh, chill CBD. They can't make health claims, but they can sure give their own experience of what's going on. And that is worth its weight in gold for us. That's where I think, you know, our spend is really going to, come back to us in a, in a return very good man it sounds promising it sounds like you've uh you've got a vision you've got that roadmap ahead and um as i say like let's we you know we're, we're behind you and i'm sure obviously a lot of the shareholders there that supported you in in, in that last raise are ultimately behind you and um you know we wish you all the best going forward and uh, i think it, it could be a very interesting you know journey ahead for for you and chill for sure. And uh, as I say, we wish you all the best. Uh, one question we need to ask you going up being the fact you're on a Sunday roast, Callum, is what is your ultimate Sunday roast? You know what? You know, you're a British guy. Um, it could be something left field. It could be, you know, you know lamb with, uh, you know, lamb chops. Or something really. you know, give, give us give us your ultimate Sunday roast. 
Yeah, you've gotten pretty close to it, Phil, actually. I'm, I'm missing uh, British food at the moment out in the States. So what I'm looking forward to when I get back, it's got to be just, uh, we're in the right season for it. We're just coming out the other side of it. Lamb, crispy roast potatoes, parsnips, all the trimmings, Yorkshire puddings, stuffing, the rest, crumble for afters. Classic. Classic, man. That's a classic one. I love it. Apple crumble with custard. That's it. Got to be. That's the way to go. And it's uh, hard to beat, hard to beat indeed. And and as you say, like that, you know, the apple crumble with the custard that's like you stand the spot. We always do the spoon test, you know, like the mum mum makes this really thick custard where you put it in the jug at the end of it, you know, and it's all been cooked and the spoon has to stand up freely on its own. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, that that's it. I mean, I I, I, I like I, I like cr- double cream with it as well. So I have a little bit on the side with double cream and then have a, a, a smashing or lashings of this thick custard. I, I, for me, that's that's just. It's a dream. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's the perfect Sunday race, that's for sure. Aside from you guys, of course. <laughs> We're far from perfect. <laughs> but anyway. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. we wish you luck with everything that you're doing and um, and we'll uh, keep in touch. Uh, I mean, can we expect some news over the next few weeks? Yeah, you know, what we're looking now at is just incremental improvements to our platform, to our activities, you know, over time. And so uh, I want to be putting out news on a regular basis. It's not going to be constantly massive trading updates, but it's going to be chill is now doing this. This appointment's been made. Uh, We've launched this product. We've started this kind of new marketplace project. And so, yeah, certainly expect things to come uh, shortly uh, and just incremental improvements to grind away and keep this so moving. Callum Summerton, CEO of Chill Brands. Thanks very much for your time. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. So what do you make of that then? I, I think, I suppose uh, my, my judgment more is on uh, Callum. And I think he's got his act together. He knows what he's trying to do. And I think I've got to give him the benefit of doubt and a lot of confidence in the fact that he can take this somewhere, I think. I think I said in the interview there that he was at, uh, at base level here now, isn't it? I think. Probably the value is in chill.com at the minute with nothing else counted for. So let's see where it goes. I think if he gets any sort of revenues moving, then it's going to be it's going to be a good one. But we will see because the whole area is developing, isn't it? As he said, they're cashed up now for a period of time. They're owed revenues as well, I think. And uh, different things are going to be coming over the next period of time. So, yeah. In the current market, who knows, but I think it's got a good chance. So what's been happening this week then? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's been a bit turgid, hasn't it, on the markets looking along. I mean, it's, um, is it the old mantra of, you know, selling May and go away, come back on St. Ledger's Day? I think there's, that there's certainly some sense in that or some, maybe some logic in that sort of thing as people move away. Obviously, we've seen crypto crash. The bottom has been wiped out. Even the so-called stable coins have been have been destabilized. We've seen a lot of that on the markets. So there's been margin calls on a lot of that sort of things within the crypto market. And I think that's obviously taken some bit of liquidity out of the main market. But ultimately, there's been some really good RNSs that we've seen this week that really haven't moved the dial, that maybe to the point that we would have expected them to do. Um, there's also been some bizarre rns's i think the one that springs to mind was on was on monday this week we got one from eurasia uh that, that, that basically said they were suspending and then there's normally obviously a follow-up rns that comes out after the 7 a.m one that explains the the reason or the rationale behind the suspension or the reason for suspension and and there wasn't one the, the, well, there was an rns on tuesday that basically just said they'll resume trading tomorrow on the Wednesday. And it was like absolutely no explanation whatsoever of a reason why they suspended for 48 hours or even 24 hours. And then there was a follow-up RNS that came out about a a, a non-executive director, I think, or, or a director that was appointed to the board. But other than that, absolutely nothing else. There was obviously a lot of speculation on the board regarding the whole Russian situation with... Uh, you know, asset grabs and things like that. And, you know, Renault of, of losing some of their assets. But for me, it was, it, I've never seen that before. Normally when you get a suspension, you get a reason, but there was none for me that I could see. Yeah. Bizarre. 
Absolutely bizarre. But maybe we'll find out one day, maybe we'll not. But I mean, a, a Russian stock that's in serious trouble, really, I think. I remember Zach quoted it as once it went below sort of seven and a half P, it was going to be in serious trouble. Um, I think it's hanging on by its fingertips, isn't it? It's about 8p. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's a poisoned asset now, obviously, simply because it's in uh, it's in Russia, or you would imagine. Anyway, I mean, maybe I'm speaking out of turn there, but... Yeah, I mean, I mean, the thing for me is uh, will... I don't like seeing any investors losing, and we've seen some absolute shockers, haven't we, in the last sort of, you know, two months on the markets of stocks that you think we're going to do well. And then, you know, you, you feel like investors have got rubbed on them. We see Empyrean Energy was a, a great example trading around the sort of eight and a half, nine, 10 P mark. And unfortunately they had the, the duster as they call it, and then it dropped back down and, you know, you, no, no one wants to see that in these, in these markets. And I'd, I'd really hate to see EUA being, you know, assets removed from, through some force, a Russian force or whatever it is, and them to be delisted or whatever, because ultimately you need these large, these 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 winners on the market, right? In in AIM and, and standard list to be able to offer that liquidity and go, oh, I'm going to take a bit of profit. We saw it in a lot of these stocks that a lot of the winners that were being, um, you know, people cut the winners. We've said this all along. People sell the winners. They slice. They don't sell the losers, or a lot of people don't. It's that growth mindset. Why would you cut a loser? You you would cut a loser. It's almost like an admission of guilt, not a guilt, but a pride. Oh my God, like the, you know, like if you look at the common investor, most people will ride the losers and they will sell the winners. And that is a bizarre mindset. It's easy for me to and you and you, you and I to sit here and go, well, that's a bizarre mindset, but that that is the reality of the situation when it comes to trading. People cut the winners and hold the losers, but in fact, maybe there's some argument that says actually you should maybe hold the winners, the ones that are you know you talked about it last week, the ones that are resilient in times where the market has dropped off. We're seeing super levels of inflation, the, the ones that are staying up there and actually sell the ones that have weakened and are not in that strength of market. Yeah. And I mean, you talk about inflation, though, that's an interesting point, because what really occurred to me this week was that uh, in all this turmoil, surely we've got to have some gold in our portfolios, you know? You're talking about um, Greatland gold seems very low valuation now, having been, you know, in... In the 30s, I think at one point, no, 30 pence plus. And now it's sort of sitting around 12, 13, 14p. I think it finished about 13p uh, on uh, on the weekend. But they're just continually finding more and more gold. And I see Conroy Gold as well in that same scenario, massively undervalued, 14, 13 million pound valuation. And uh, they're going to have millions of ounces of gold. It's almost inevitable. So um, in this hyperinflation time, uh, what is the asset that they insist uh, you should own? It's gold. It's not cryptocurrencies. It's gold. Yeah. And, uh, you know, are we going to see the time of the gold miner over the next couple of years? Because this inflation isn't going to be a few months and then yeah, I mean, go away. I agree. I, th I think there's two things here. I think you've got to look at that gold was always a hedge against inflation, right? Mm -hmm. But obviously I think things have changed. I think obviously Bitcoin came in for that sort of, you know, you kind of like, it kind of replaced gold and it, it, it was, it became the new gold. Let's just say that for argument's sake, right? But what you've got to look at is that right now, Fears are rising, right? Right now in these in the whole thing, slowing economies spread all over the world. You've got UK, European stock markets are completely like the the following the sharp falls we've seen in the US and Asia. We saw that on Thursday. I think like the FTSE 100 sank about one or one point eight two percent on Thursday, and the main stock markets in France, in France and Germany, in Europe also saw some declines. Wednesday, we saw like they recorded their biggest one day drop since the early days of COVID pandemic in 2020, which was, yeah, it was March 2020. <laughs> so we've seen this, witness this massive one day drop, right? 
Now, inflation is an interesting thing. Like, is it, I think a lot of people panic and they go sell, right? Now, cash has always been, people say cash is king. Is it though? So if if you've got rampant rates of inflation and the pound isn't spent or dollar isn't isn't getting you as much as you would have, why would you want to take it to a fiat currency when you can put it into a non-inflationary or, or an inflationary proof asset like a watch or you know collectible watch or a car or a house or a business? Or even a stock, like as you mentioned, maybe gold, or even a junior, you know, a minor. You know what I mean? It's like, do people are people misinterpreting the whole thing, selling out, thinking that cash will get them further? So, for instance, UK has announced nine percent increase in 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 inflation rates, roughly, right? Now, that doesn't factor in a certain element of things like food or you know energy prices. So, so let let's say the real world figure in the UK now is 25%. And listeners may balk at that and go, you're wrong. If you do your research, you'll probably find it is about 25% is the real world inflationary percentage that we have seen within the last six months, okay? Take that figure. If you were earning £3,000 a month after tax, you would need to be earning around 3800 or 4000 let's call it £4,000 just to be kind of like ver- on, on the safe side. So, That is the reality here is that you need to be earning 25% more just to make, you know, just just to make do that. that, that, That's the reality. And how many people in this country have that extra earning power that can bring in that extra 25% on the wage? And that's why I I think there's there's a really gloomy forecast that's looming over us. I, I don't know what the way out is. What we're saying is, or what you're saying is, inflation is is high. And if you leave it in cash, you're going to get 1% on your money or 2% on your money. So in real terms, you're going to be losing money just by leaving it in cash. So the, the reality is we've got to be in assets that we think are going to go up with inflation. And most of those things that we're thinking about are real things like gold, like the battery metals, like oil like gas, because those things are also going to go up in value and you're going to hold your valuations and hold the real value of your money and maybe even increase the real value of your money. Now, what has happened to the market recently here is just liquidity has pulled out of the market and that liquidity has then caused a problem because the share prices of a lot of these stocks have gone down because of lack of liquidity. There's not the money there. So, yeah, who knows? I mean, we're not going to solve the problem, but uh, it's it's a big problem. I mean, you say 25% in the UK. Uh, in, in Egypt, it's probably 40, 40% plus, basically because everything everything is going up significantly. But what other news have we seen this week? We had There was an interview there with Adam for Ben's Creek suggesting that the trains are going to go out next week, Two, three trains actually over the next uh, 10 days which should bring them in revenue of circa $14 million and, you know, basically EBITDA of half of that, at least $7 million US dollars. And also predicting that by July, I think it was July, August, they're going to be full, full steam ahead on full production of 70,000 or so tons per month, which is going to be amazing. And the EBITDA on that is going to be, pretty serious you know in terms of what they're going to be able to make 200 dollars a ton so you work it out that is a lot of cash that's going to be coming into that business what about yourself phil what else happened this week it's been going it's on been, i i almost i i said to a couple of people on the on the boards and the boards were very quiet as well it's like the market almost became becalmed you know there was so little volume that 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 not much was happening. I mean, what did happen actually on Friday was uh, Tech Minerals had another good uh, RNS saying that the the deal was done for that uh, for that land. So uh, nine hundred thousand pounds cash into the bank, and ultimately they were at five and a half p only a couple of months ago, and this was before the. Uh, analysis came out the environmental analysis for the 
lead acid battery plant, which is now about to start and produce revenue of eight to nine million pounds a year. I'm sorry, not even revenue, EBITDA. And and it's now 2.85p. So you work it out. It doesn't make any sense. And five years from now, they should have plus 10 of these uh, of these factories around UK and Europe, all producing the same amount of money. Uh, in fact, the lithium ion ones are more money. So it seems a bit of a crazy situation, that. But uh, there are many mismatches at the minute, I think, in many stocks. Um, so we may be mentioning a few, but there are many, and we understand that there are many, but you can't obviously talk about them all. The other one that we um, that we saw move this week a little bit was obviously the last Sunday roast we did with with BSF Enterprises. That 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 was the one that was effectively there was an acquisition of three D bio tissues, and we saw that list. Oh, that's right. Yeah, the IPO was around seven point three eight or seven point. Let's call it seven point four for argument's sake. And they opened up on the Tuesday of this week around the sort of like eight nine mark, and I think they went up to about eleven pence. It closed around the nine nine and a half p this week, so there's been some interest in them. But I don't. I think there's many people that have not been able to buy on certain, you know, dependent on which platform they're using. We we firmly believe that this one is is, is one that could be a, a game changer. I certainly do in terms of that the whole uh, lab grown meat space. It's an interesting area. Um, you know, for me, it's it's it, it, you know you look at some similarly positioned companies that are listed in the US um, that are backed potentially by the likes of um, Bezos in there. You know, in 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 this industry and in this space, they, they see that area of things. Then um, you know, the, 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 there's a big potential in this market, right? Yeah, and I mean, the thing that attracted me more to this company than uh, than anything else was that. I think because it sells the the medium or the media or whatever you want to call it, that the, the meat actually grows or uses to grow. And it's a vegetarian uh, alternative. Um, and they have the IP on that. And, you know, there's potential there to make a huge amount of money just on selling this as well as progressing the process. So, yeah, it looks very exciting, actually, and it's still relatively cheap i think uh only maybe eight nine million pounds in terms of its valuation um and those those companies that you're talking about in america are worth billions of dollars not not a few not millions so you know the potential upside for this for them to generate this and use the the science which they have understood and know to really create proper meat with the fine intricacies of the cells and how they're created is, is fascinating, but I think it could be very profitable as well. So yeah, very interesting. There's another one that we, um, we talked to this week, which is going to be an interesting listing. I think it's going to happen within the next sort of say two weeks to a month is a company called Spectrum X. And they are effectively within, with the, within the sanitizer the cosmetic and the pharmaceutical industry. So there's effectively like three strings to the bow or three bows to the string, however you want to refer to that. But basically the way it works is this is something almost unique. This is something that uses, leverages a technology called hypochlorous acid or HOCL. And if you Google that, you'll see exactly what I'm referring to. Basically what it is, it's a, it's a organic, acid that is found within our bodies that is is within white blood cells okay so it's taking a natural acid that exists with us right now yeah that is within our white blood cells now as you probably know white blood cells are responsible for fighting infection and disease and you know that that is effectively our our immune system right so basically what they're going to do or what they're aiming to do is to take this hocl and create they've already done this they've, they've created and they actually have a laboratory in nutsford in, in the north northwest of england that produces this hand sanitizer that is alcohol free now get your head around that now we joked about this didn't we kev this week when i said <laughs> i never thought i'd see the day during the lockdown or any time within the last two years where my hands would see more alcohol than my mouth, right? And you Which joke. was obviously untrue, but yes. 
But it happened, mate. It did happen. You know, well, it, whatever. We, we didn't. But, it was untrue for sure. My um, hands saw more alcohol than my mouth, maybe, but not yours. So, so ultimately, th- this is this is a problem, right? There's a, there's many angles, and they are already have agreements with NHS. You know, the different NHS. Uh, facilities and uh, you know, they, they basically, yeah, there's NHS. One of the trusts in London has already taken it. Yeah. So basically, and got- I mean, the the most amazing thing I found about our conversation that we had with uh, it was Damien, wasn't it? Um, was that one of the things that they're doing is little sachets uh, that you put through a nebulizer, and effectively it can clean out your lungs and clean out your airways so that even if you might be coming down with a cold or coming down with the flu or coming down with covid that actually it would kill it before it had a chance to to take root and they're they're basically going through trials to test this at the minute and that you take this nebulizer uh, so say your child comes home, they've started sneezing or a cough, and you don't want to give it to the rest of the family as well, then the child takes the nebulizer for a day or two, uh, a couple of times a day, and basically it will clear out their whole system, clear out their lungs, and the infection should be killed. Because this stuff in our body kills the, the infections anyway. Yeah, so it's attacking, so, attacking it from, a, from an outside angle. But what interests me is that you've got like, Synergen SNG, who've got um, who had a market cap up to something like 380 million on a nebulizer for, for COVID 19. They were doing trials, still doing trials down in, in Southampton. And I think the last RNS was, was crazy because it had something like a three percent success rate against placebo effects, which is just that could be a margin for error, right? We were we've already sort of chatted about this. It's unbelievable. Anyway, the point I'm making is that they're going to list around the sort of 58 to 60 million cap or the Spectrum X. And they've already got products there that are the selling these, these these hand sanitizers. They've got the cosmesis range that's coming out that's, that's being manufactured in this plant that's got capability for something like three million liters of, of this HOCL. So so basically, this HOCL HOCL product that I'm referring to, and you can do a bit of research on it. The issue with it in the past is. It's never been stable enough to be able to be, you know, outside the body. So it's like within, say, 30 seconds of it being in, 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 you know, within the environment, it's lost its efficacy and it's gone. The, the, the difference with this company is the USP is that they have managed. To, it's a stable product now that they've manufactured through an Iranian guy in the US who's, who's, who's he is the brains behind his product. And actually, the story behind this is very interesting, Kev, isn't it? With Damien, who, who was the CEO, and how he became interested or how he was sort of put onto this product. So I believe his, his father or his grandfather was came down with some um, ne- necrotizing. Yeah, it was, it was his father. His father. But don't tell, don't tell the full story, because let him tell it, because we're going to interview him next week. <laughs> so basically, basically, Damien was in a situation where he, there was a... There was a you know, a family member that would that basically was affected by a certain condition and he was then pushed and moved in and investigated this particularly in new science. And he was he was then introduced to a professor in the US, an Iranian born professor. And that's really is, is all you need to hear at this moment is, is, is that this technology is down to the stability of it and how it can be harnessed. I think that's enough for today. The markets are purely depressing at the minute so let's hope we get some liquidity back in people start realizing that actually cash isn't a very safe place to be when you've got lots of uh, lots of inflation on the on the way and uh yeah good luck everybody because i think we all need it at the minute yeah on that note have a great weekend and we'll, we'll speak soon yeah This podcast was brought to you by Roast PR Limited. If you would like to appear on a future episode of The Sunday Roast, please email admin at thesundayroast.net.